to Roar Ministries. We're delighted that you have chosen to worship the Lord with us today. And we want to take the time to welcome you into our virtual sanctuary. Surely we are glad that you have gathered with us. It is a blessing to be able to come before the Lord and share this experience with you. So while you are here, we want you to get comfortable. We want you to really be in a place of freedom where you can truly worship the Lord with us in spirit and in truth. For that is um, a commandment from the Lord himself that is written in his word that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth so we welcome you to ensure that you're in a place where you can do just that we also believe that God is gonna meet us here at the point of our knees no matter what we may have before the Lord whether we believe it is great or small God is a God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us so I believe that by the time you leave the service today that you're gonna leave encouraged you're gonna leave strength and you're gonna leave blessed blessed knowing that God has heard every petition that you may have before him and he's going to give you a word that's going to confirm everything that he is doing in your life. I believe God just like that and I know God has given Pastor Ken a word that's going to bless every listener that has taken the time to join us in our virtual sanctuary. No matter if you're watching us live during the day that we are airing the broadcast or if you're catching the replay, I believe that there is a word from the Lord and is going to meet you at the point of your need. At this time, I would like to take the opportunity to pray for today's service. So won't you agree in prayer with me by bowing your heads and praying along with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come to you, Father, we just thank you for this day. For your word has declared that this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come before your presence, God. Lord, we thank you that you are God. You are Lord over our lives. We thank you that you are king. You are ruler of everything. Lord God, we just thank you for your sovereignty, God. We thank you, God, that you are great and greatly to be praised. Now, as we come to you as your people, as a body of believers, Father, we ask that you touch this service, God. Lord God, we ask that it be a vehicle to be able to be a witness for your kingdom, God. We ask that you touch our our pastor, Father. Lord God, we ask that you anoint his lips, God. Give him clarity of speech. We thank you, oh God, that as he speak a word that you have given him, that lives will be changed, lives will be saved, delivered, set free, healed and made whole in the name of Jesus. We thank you for every petition that individuals may have before you. We thank you that you are a God that specializes in the impossible and that there is nothing, absolutely nothing too hard for you. And we thank you for the manifestation of your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. And God, most of all, we thank you for being among us. We're asking God that you continuously dwell among us for we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. So God, we thank you in advance for all that you are going to do, Father. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen and amen. I believe God is going to do something great for us. Surely, I feel the presence of the Lord. And just as I feel the presence of the Lord here, I know that you feel him exactly where you may be tuning in from. And I thank God for the opportunity to be able to worship him with you today. Now at this time, we want to worship God together. So let's enter into our next level of worship. Won't you come to the well that never runs dry? Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come and thirst no more. 
Hallelujah. Isn't it good to know that God is turning graves into gardens? Things that we thought were dead in our lives, God is bringing those things back. He's, he's restoring those things that we lost. God is just that awesome. Things that we thought were dead and gone, like relationships and 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 and, uh, and financial dreams and 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 career aspirations, things that we thought that we were never accomplished because we had certain mishaps in our life or mistakes happened or things that we were involved in, things that that that, that, that hindered us, things that stopped us from before from getting to this this level and that level. God is bringing those things back and He's restoring them as he is the only one who can do those things. Uh, I can't do it myself. I need God's help. I need him to take over. I don't know about you, but I've tried it my own way. I've tried it, I've tried it this way, that way, and every other way, but I'm sticking to the only one I know who can do all things. Through, through Christ, all things are possible. I need you to know that right now on this afternoon that all things are possible for those who love the Lord. All things are possible. Everything you want, everything you dream, everything you aspire to be is possible because God is God. Simply that, simply that and it's good to be reminded that of what Jesus did on the cross, it's good to be reminded of what he's doing in our lives this very day. It's good to be reminded of what he did for you last week. I know uh, I know many people have praise reports from last week and two weeks ago. Well, I want you to know that this week you're going to have another praise report. You're going to have a, another uh, thing to witness about, about the goodness of God and the provision of God and the ways he's moved, the ways that he's, he's made, the mountains he's moved, the, uh, the health he's restored, the relationships that you thought were lost. He's going to bring those back to, back to you, uh, those, those children that were wayward they're going to come home god is going to do the the miraculous things on this week we not we're not just loving god because of you know of what he can give us but we're loving him for who he is we're loving god for who he is he's a way maker god he's a healing god he's a provider god He's a uh, he's a mountain killing God. He's a demon killing God. God is the God of all power. I need you to know that right now that you serve, that you are in tune with the great and mighty and powerful God. We we here at, at, at Roy Ministries, we love God. We love the the person of God. We uh, we reverence God. We love God with every fiber of our beings. We love God with every day of our lives. We love God. We want to live with God and we want to live for God. Whatever he has for us to do in this world, we want to do it. What, even if it's things that we never thought that we'd be able to do or reach people that we never thought we would be able to reach, we want to be a part of of the calling of the Lord. We, again, here at Roar Ministries, we love God, we want to live with God, and we want to live for God. We're not about any other hoopla, but, but just those three simple things. I know, I, I'm sorry, I really got ahead of myself. I'm Ken Mathis, lead pastor of Roar Ministries, and we're excited to have you here on today. I know it seems like I'm preaching right now, but I'm just, uh, just just being reminded of the goodness of God, the forgiving God, the acceptance of God. You know, just just just, just be reminded of how good God is. Um, last week was our our, our Mother's Day service. My mother-in-law and my mother, two dynamic women of God, along with my wife as well. Um, they did an awesome, awesome service. I thank my mom for an awesome word. Um, I thank my mother-in-law for an awesome prayer as well. And God was, uh, was truly in the house and people were blessed as well. You know, and, you know, and, and that's one thing that we want to do is make sure that people are blessed. People 
get, get an opportunity to uh, use their gifts and talents the way that God intended. Um, you know, um, in, in the next next few weeks, I believe, I think next week, actually, I will have uh, Minister Daniel Gant will be here and she will be bringing a powerful word, a word of faith. Um, she's not only my wife's best friend, but she's a good friend of mine as well. And she's the daughter of our overseer as well, um, Pastor Dan. And we, uh, we just, we just, we just love God and we want to see, uh, his people be blessed. And, we, and no matter if it's my, if it's God using me to bring the word or if it's, if it's, if it's God using anybody that, that he sees fit. We're going to make sure that the people of God will always be blessed. Forgive me, that was my phone. You don't have to silence your phone, but that was mine. I, I apologize, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, moving, moving right along, we're going to move forward into our next uh, phase, which we're going to do tithes and offering. The information will be will appear on the bottom of the screen. If, you, if you're using the church online app, um, there should be three lines in the top right hand corner and or top left hand corner, excuse me. And if you click on the, the, the gift tab, it'll take you to our website and how you can give as well. I want to pray a special prayer for those who are giving on today, even, even if you don't have a have anything to give. And but if you're just giving your time and giving your focus. Um, I want to allow allow God to, to 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 bless you and to bring back uh, anything that you that you need as well. So join me as I pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your everlasting love towards us. We thank you for everything you've done for us and you and you are doing and you will continue to do, Father God. I want to bless, I want you to ask that you bless those who have a heart to give. You know, even, even if they didn't give anything on today, maybe they'll give on the next time as well. Or maybe, God, you let them here just to give, get a word in and, 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 and them giving their focus and their time and their obedience to your will and your word is how you want to bless them, Father God. Yeah. I'm asking that you, that you bless those who have given, those who have heart to give, one, 100, 1,000, 1 million fold, Father God, for they are giving not unto us, but they're giving unto you. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Um, you know, I, I, again, God's been doing tremendous things here. And um, after this quick reminder um, a special reminder, I'll be back with the word for today. Amen. I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. I am working all things for your good. I will withhold no good thing from you. I am your shield and your great reward. I am your light and your salvation. I am the stronghold of your life. I will give you eternal life. I will give you abundant life. I will give you peace. I will give you rest. I will give good gifts to those who ask me, and I will give strength to the weary, power to the weak. I am close to the brokenhearted, and I will comfort those who mourn. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will hear you, forgive you, and heal you. I will be found by those who seek me. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will do whatever you ask in my name. I will listen to you. I will fight for you. I will set you free and I will not change. I will redeem your life from the pit and crown you with love and compassion. I will finish the good work I have begun in you. I will never blot your name out of the book of life. I will come back and take you to be with me. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. It's good to always be in remembrance of the promises of God, the promises that he's spoken over each and every one of our lives, that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, he'll be our strength, our hope, our shield, our provider. 
it's good to always be remembrance of the promises of God. This world can cause us to go for a trip, cause us to doubt ourselves, doubt what we see, doubt what's happening in our own lives, doubt what's happening in the, in the world around us, in the lives of other people, and even doubt our God himself. But it's good to always be in remembrance of his promises. It will keep you on a firm foundation and it keep you from blowing away from every wind of doctrine that, that, that comes out of society as well. Make sure that you always keep the promises of God in your mind and in your heart. So, uh, you know, again, I'm happy about what God is doing here at Roar. I'm happy what God is doing in the land and the lives of his people. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started this faith and identity um, topic here under our faith and actions in, in series. Uh, so if you could get a chance, go ahead and go to YouTube and you can check out uh, faith and identity part one. Um, and so we're going to go into uh, part two today. We're still dealing with the familiar story in Luke 15, 11 through 24. Uh, we're dealing with the father who had two sons, one that was lost and one that stayed at home. Again, that's Luke 15, 11 through 24. Um, I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm going to give you a quick summary, but I do um, I do tell people to please go read this so you, you can know the word for yourself so you can allow God to speak those truths to you as well. Allow God to, to reveal his word to you in whatever way that you need it and in, in whatever way the people around you need it as well. So it's here that we see Jesus telling us the story of a father and his two sons. The youngest son demands his inheritance early. The father doesn't hesitate to provide him with what is being asked of him. And then the son goes out and proceeds to live it up the way he wants to and to spend all that he has been given. And sometime after, you know, the land that he's in suffers a environmental and an economical crisis. And, uh, and he finds himself in dire straits. He thought he's uh, he's going through challenges and, ch and changes. And then he goes in search of sensible work and becomes a permanent citizen of the country that he has joined himself to. Uh, the only work that he's given is the work of, of a pig farmer. And, and after almost succumbing to starvation and, and just imagining himself eating what the pigs eat, he says, you know what? I have an epiphany moment. I can go home. I can go back to my father's house, even as a servant, because his servants live better than I'm living right now. So I'm going to get up and go home to my father's house. While he is, while he is on his journey uh, and, and, and he's, he's almost home, his father sees him, runs to him, kisses him, embraces him, and welcomes him back as a son and not a servant. This parable, you know, has been told many, many years uh, throughout, the, throughout the years. And it's, it, it's the, the very concept of this father's unlimited love and his forgiveness that will always bring people who hear the story to tears. Uh, it's, it's, it's parallel to God's love for us, how it's unlimited, it's unmatched and always full of forgiveness. No matter what situation that we we're facing, no matter what circumstance that we are encountering, God's love is the same. So in this story, we read about the kind hearted and faithful father and his very two different sons. But for the passage that we're going to talk about today, we're going to focus on the young son only. Uh, it seems that both sons were raised, were raised the same. Uh, if it was their father who was who we see was compassionate. So, which means he must have been a compassionate role model for both of them. Uh, the father doesn't hesitate to give what his son had asked of him, which means the generosity of the father is something that both sons had witnessed before. Uh, both sons were smart and educated, uh, and they were dedicated to to their father's land, the father's estate. But, and, then, and also both had knowledge of Jewish law and customs. And how do we know that they both had knowledge of uh, Jewish law and customs and that they had knowledge of their father's estate and his wealth? For it's, it was law 
and for it was Jewish law that in in the event of, of un, un, untimely death by, by their father, that they were they would receive an inheritance from his estate. Now, by Jewish custom, the oldest the oldest son, the firstborn, would get a double portion, and then every other um, sibling a, after that son, and if they if not the son, if the daughter, they would get one third. So this young his young son was due a, a one-third of inheritance from his father's estate. So they both knew that they had something coming. Regardless of what would took place, they knew, he knew he had something coming. However, this young son did not want to wait. He wanted his right now. He knew everything he wanted to do with it, and he was ready to do it. He, he was ready to do it. He knew what he wanted. So even though he was raised differently, the young son wanted to live another type of lifestyle, one that, would, that his father did not put before him, one that probably his brother did not put before him, one that he seen of the world and he liked what they were doing, he liked what they, the promises that they had to offer, and he wanted to be a part of it all. For, you know, uh, last week we dealt with, dealt with the fact that um, of identity theft, uh, taking the uh, taking um, over someone else's identity because you're either so uh, frustrated with your own, or you're so um, you or, or you don't like the way it's going, the way, the way your life is going. You don't like the cards you have been dealt. You don't. So you want to change everything. You want to take over someone else's identity to do things the way they would do it and to get the benefits that they had. But for it seems that this young son took over the identity of someone else. Uh, he he began displaying characteristics that were not taught in his home uh, or taught around him. He, he starts t taking on characteristics of, of another man. He, he even moved to the climate of that man and eventually paid the cost of that man. It what seems that the, the, the identity he stole was the that of a man named Flesh. For Luke 15 and 17 says it like this. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I will perish with hunger. Some other versions version say it like this. And he finally came to his senses. But and I tell people the only way you can come to your senses is when you realize uh, you have you have been in, in, in your right mind. But just like it says in, uh, in Luke 15, 17, in the King James Version, it says that he came to himself. Well, the only way you can come to yourself is when you realize you have not been being yourself. You have been living the life of someone else. So this young son began to live the life of someone else. And that's what, and that's what we call identity theft. And when we, when, when, when we take on the identity of the flesh, that, that, that leads us to take on the characteristics of the flesh, the, the climate of the flesh, and eventually pay the cost of the flesh. So last week we dealt with the characteristics of the flesh. So when you have a moment, I, I, I tell you, go to, go to YouTube, type in ROR Ministries or Aurora Ministries, and you'll be able to see not only last week, but also other weeks as well. But so you can uh, uh, be right in tune with us as well. So we're going to focus on the two latter parts, the two latter points on uh, we, how we move to the climate of the flesh and how we eventually pay the cost of the flesh. Now, for the sake of time, and 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 because of they are because they're so closely knit, I'm going to combine these last two points. I'm going to, I'm going to combine them because they're uh, they're so tied into one another. So uh, we not only take on the characteristics of the flesh of, of of our flesh, but we eventually move to the climate of our flesh and pay the eventual cost of our flesh. Luke 15 uh, 13 through 16 says it like this. Not long after that, the, the, young, the young, younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. 
And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pies that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. See, we always want to be a, a, around others who aspire to do what we're doing. We want to be in the company of like-minded people. We join ourselves to people who are living the way that we want to live, who are going the way we want to go, who are doing the things that we want to do. We're always looking for or looking to be a part of a community. Looking to be a part of community. If, if you turn to social media, there's different com communities of people. Uh, if you go to your um, your your uh, your local area, they're always talking about joining different communities. You have communities for single moms, communities for single dads. You have communities for um, you know um, pe for people raising children of, of of different cultural backgrounds. You have different communities of uh, pe people who are who are who are uh, joining with people who have, who are experiencing children with certain disabilities and people who come from certain different uh, areas. You have all types of communities that are being, um, being that have been born and are being filled with people. I mean, and to the point where you have, you have different type of communities that have people who like rock climbing, who, who like to be a, a outdoor adventurers, who like um, LARPing, uh, you know, who, who like doing a, bu a bunch of things, who play certain video games. We're always looking for a community. When I turn on my oh, my, uh, my my PS4, it asks me if I want to join certain communities because we always want to be around people who do what we do. So what is a, what is a community? Just, just so we can have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about. It's a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. A feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. It's our nature to want to develop community with other people who share our beliefs and our interests. But we have to be mindful of not only what we believe, but what those interests are. The book of Galatians 5 13 through 16 says like this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's our nature to want to be around people of like mindedness. We, we, we want to be a part of community. If people who are living like we live, people who are going where we're going, doing what we're doing, interested, interested in what we're interested in. You know, if you want to be successful in your career, you probably want to be around people who are successful in the field that you're going in or 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 the what you're aspiring to be. If you like certain types of cars, you want to be a, a part of a community of other car enthusiasts. If you want to be if if you like sports, you want to be a part of sports groups. I, you know, for me myself, I like Marvel movies. I, I like comic book movies, I'll, I'll be a part of communities of people who like what I like. So we can talk about, we can always discuss things. We can talk, to, we can toss theories back and forth with, with one another and enjoy each other's company. Doctors hang around other doctors, lawyers hang around other lawyers. But you want me to believe that you're hanging around people who are doing different things that you're doing and you're not, you're not affected by it. 
for in the scripture, we can glean that if we are living by the spirit, then we will want to be around or surround ourselves with people who are doing what we do or who are living as we want to live or as we live. You know, uh, if people who are who are, who are going where we're going, we will want to be a part of the Christian community. You know, when you, if you remember, if you recall, when you were a new believer, you surrounded yourselves around people who have been doing this thing a little bit longer than you. For you wanted to aspire to be like them, to have the faith that they have, to uh, uh, to be full of the spirit like them. But if we're actively living in our flesh and doing the things of our flesh, that only makes sense that we, we, we want to be around people who are doing what we do, going where we're, where, where we're going, interested in what we're interested in, having the same goals as we have. But I, I mentioned a few weeks ago about zombie type behavior and the characteristics that can impact not only our lives, but the lives of those connected to us. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. We have to be mindful here because if we let our fleshly aspirations and desires get out of control, we not only become a hindrance to someone, but we can also possibly destroy them as well. That's that's something here. Because a lot of us in this generation are product of our people, people who came before us, product of our fathers and our mothers and product of our aunts and uncles. And, and even now to the church, we're product of old preachers and deacons and, 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 and mothers and elders and and other laymen as well. We're, we're product of what we saw. Product of what, what we witnessed. So uh, in the, uh, a lot of our ways are because we've seen what other people do. And I've seen it in my own generation. Yeah, pe people who preached one thing but lived another way. And now their kids do the same thing. We have gotten good at playing church. We have gotten good at seeing uh, uh, different uh, slogans and different um, and, and, and different uh, uh, things that church people say. You know, we, we have the problem saying, ain't he all right? We have the problem saying, let the church say amen. We have the problem moving our hands. We have the problem saying, ooh, that word was so good. Hallelujah. Ooh, that's, that was good. And then go off and do and live our lives in fleshly manners. Uh, I've seen it before, I, before my own eyes. Preachers who have preached one thing, but we get behind closed doors and their conversation is different. Where we're talking about the holiness of the Lord one moment. Now we're talking about the hem of, of her skirt the next. We're talking about uh, how great and how good God is. And then we're talking about how much money did, did, did we raise? How much money did we collect? And what we can do with that money. You know, I've been a part of circles where I've had men of God ask me to do certain things that, that, like that compromise my own character. And 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 I and I to be honest, I did some things that people would say, "You really, you did that because I wanted to please the person that was over me." The man of God called called on my name to do a certain task for him uh, to uh, to to bring a certain person to him, and I was a part of it because I let someone else's. Uh, fleshly ways influence me. So we have to be careful because just because we can handle it doesn't mean someone else can. Just because we have a hold on it doesn't mean it won't consume someone else. Just, just because you have your drinking under control doesn't mean those watching you and those coming behind you will have, will, will have the same self-control. 
Just, just because you know how to fake it doesn't mean that they'll know how to fake it. Because the generation that's coming after us are doing things worse, far off worse than us than we ever even imagined at our ages. I remember growing up, the, 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 the most common thing that we had to worry about was teen pregnancy. Now we have to worry about pronouns. Now we have to worry about if 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 if, if I'm addressing you, addressing you, addressing you the way that you desire to be addressed. God made you he, but you feel like a she today, so you want to be called a she or her. You want those pronouns in front of your name because now they're assigned to your new identity. You gotta be mindful that sin begets sin, so sin will be, bring bring more sin, but not just to our own our own lives, but to the lives of those who are around us as well. We have to be mindful that our behavior can bite and devour someone else. You have Christians that came in came into churches. I mean, people that came in, into churches and had joined certain ministries or certain churches. And then I started adapting new lifestyles because of the what they witnessed before. And they feel like if God can bless them while they do this, then I'm okay doing what I'm doing as well. Or I can do what they do and then they'll be affected and bound down and consumed by it. There's, there is no, there's no other way to explain how the rapid homosexuality has ran through the church. Because we think we can do it, uh, we can do it. We can live our own way and and still be pleasing to God. Not just homosexuality, but uh, you know, um, different theologies have hit, have ran through the church. Uh, different ways of living as people want to live. Um, different ways of uh, 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 the, the word is, is, is excuse me is escaping my mind right now, but um, you know, living a different adulterous lifestyles. There, are, it, it's crazy to think that it's a lower number of men not cheating on their wives than the ones that are, even in leadership. Now we have to worry about. Mental health. We have to worry about our leaders touching our our youth because they seen it in their own background, and now now they're in leadership positions doing the same thing. That's why it's 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 common to read about politicians. It's common to read about about preachers involved in sex scandals and 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 and, 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 and involved in. And sex with with with, uh, with minors because that common mentality, a flesh mentality, has ran the rapid through not only the church but the world as well, and its leaders. Our flesh will always respond to temptation. I'm getting back on course here. I feel like I'm, I was on my soapbox, and now I'm off. Matthew 26 and 41 says like this, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This, then the spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is weak. Our flesh will always respond to temptation. Always. Our flesh is pulled by our flesh, I mean, by, 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 by temptation. That's that's why when someone comes to you with the wrong way, your your interest is, is a little bit peaked. Uh, the, 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 that's why when the enemy whispers something to you, your 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 interest is a little bit peaked. That's why it's a, it's a little struggle for you because your flesh responds to temptation. We just read it that. Even though we, even though the spirit inside us want to do the right thing, our flesh is always weak. We want to do it, like just like Paul said in, in the book of Romans, we, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Have you ever, have you ever you know, uh, gone down a path where you, 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 where you committed sin after sin, and you wake up and you're like, I don't even want to be here. I don't really like doing what I'm doing. 
I don't like being who who I am. I don't like doing. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to be. But I can't seem to stop. That's that's because you have you have taken the scripture and you have reversed it. Your spirit is weak, but your flesh is strong. That's why it says you have to watch and pray. Be watchful of your surroundings, surroundings, but always pray. Be in, in communication with God so you may not, so you don't have to enter in temptation. Because while the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, God will always make a way of escape for us to overcome what we encounter. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says it like this. No temptation has overtaken you, but that it is common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. No temptation has come to you that, that, that's not being given to everybody else. So the temptation that you're encountering is common. I know it seems strong. I know it's like, like, like a, a big pull, but it's common. It's something about learning that our stronghold is common. What's pulling at our hearts is common. And because it's so common, we serve an uncommon God that has the power to bring us back from it at any moment. If we let them. So I know that the, the, the temptation and the drive to live out fleshly aspirations and desires are strong. But know this. God is stronger. He has already made a way of escape even before the temptation comes. And that way is the Holy Spirit. The push for, of us. The push of our flesh to live to any old way is always there. It's always going to be there. Your flesh is always going to be there until the day of Jesus Christ. Your flesh is going to be there, but the pull of the Holy Spirit is unmatched in its power. What does that mean for us? It gives us the power to not only run away from temptation physically, but also mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and even socially, and even financially. We can run away from it. But if we give into the temptation and focus on it, we will, we will find ourselves living in the same state as this young man. Longing and looking for a place that shared his fleshly desires. We will find ourselves looking for communities centered around our fleshly aspirations. You can see that today the world has developed its own communities and collective lifestyles and interests. You can look at society today. People are changing their genders. So they want to be around people who see them as the new person that, that they see themselves. Laws are being changed to reflect evil desires. People are all, are all out for self. Churches are turning into debauchery safety centers. It's, oh, you, 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 you can come to our church. Our preacher doesn't preach about X, Y, and Z, so you feel comfortable. We don't we don't harp on sin. We harp on love. We we don't we we uh we don't harp on uh, uh sinful desires and and and, and 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 fleshly actions. We more fo focus on living our best life, living prosperity lives. Preachers aren't giving the word, but they're rather giving get rich quick doctrine schemes. Families are turning against one another. People are teaching sexual immorality and orientation to children. We're giving our children a choice that they didn't, that, 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 that they, that they didn't know they had. 
Like, oh, do you want to do, it's not just do you want Apple Jacks or Fruit Loops. It's do you want to wear a dress or would you rather wear pants? Do you, do you feel like you're attracted to other children that are, that are like-minded like you, that, that look like you? And not only are they giving them, teaching them, but they're coaching them. And get this, your, your child will always want to be pleasing to you. So if, if they feel that you're swaying them to be a certain type of way, they will do so and, and they will take on the mindset and the identity of whatever pleases their parents. Our society has become a breeding place of fleshly behavior, which gives those who live by the flesh safe and judgment-free communities of people. But let us not assign ourselves or hook ourselves up to communities that promote and, pro and promise sinful or fleshly acceptance. I'm going to say that once, one, one more time. Let us not assign ourselves or hook ourselves up to communities that promote and promise sinful and fleshly acceptance. Because while we may focus on escaping human judgment, we are forgetting about divine judgment. While people may accept you, God won't. And we should only concern ourselves with God's acceptance and not of people's. And, the, the, and the, just, just like I said before, this goes for the church as well. We cannot live our lives to please people, even our leaders. Because God's love is that agape love. Love without judgment and restrictions. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to maintain it. It's free for all. You don't have to live a certain way because your pastor or your bishop or your teacher told you tells you to, or or they or or do things the way that they would do things because you want to be like them. You want to please them, and then when you, then when you don't then when when you step off their pedestal or when you step off. And you have a fall, or which is common, you have a fall, or you have a a a, a setback. They want to look at you funny. They want to pull you pull you to the side. They want to check your coattail. They want to make you feel worse than you already feel. Why? Because you're not. You cannot live to please people. God's love is without judgment and restrictions. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to maintain it. It's free for you, no matter. No, no matter if you are uh, righteous or unrighteous, it's his. He loves you just the same. No matter if you fall, no matter if you get up, uh, he loves you just the same. Uh, now, understand this. I'm gonna say this, and I promise you, we're just about done. Getting back to our story, when. When uh, it says that the famine hit the whole country, which means it did not just hit this young man alone. It hit the whole entire country he was a part of, which means it's everything he was experiencing, everyone else around him was experiencing the same thing. It was common. The only difference was he was in an area that he did not know. He, he, he was living the life of a person that, he did, that, that, that did not teach how to how to survive a famine, how to be prepared, how to be strong. He was living the life of someone who was not capable of, of sustaining him. And so as we, as, as, as we read, the only job that he can get was working with pigs. Now, uh, I'm not talking, saying that anything about Pig farmers and saying they're un they're 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 they're, uh, they're dirty people. I have nothing against that because I'm, even myself, I love a piece of bacon. But this was the only job he can get. Now this may not seem like just a just this may seem like just just a low paying job. However, 
it had some significance. Because for a Jewish man, this was forbidden. If you, uh, uh, that they were not allowed to not only touch pigs, they were not allowed to eat pigs. And by Jewish law, pigs were labeled as unclean animals. They couldn't eat them. They couldn't touch them. You can find that in the book of, uh, the book of, of Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7. That Jewish men and women were not allowed to come in contact with pigs. They were not allowed to come in contact uh, to, 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 to be near them, to, to touch them, or to eat them. But this was the only job he can get, a job that was beneath him. Now, let me just clarify for, for, for just, just before you get your, uh, on your, your, your righteous soapbox and, and take bacon out of my mouth. Jesus, when Jesus died, he fulfilled every part of the law. He, and, he, and, and, and those same customs no longer, they, they no longer stand to the day. You, you can, you can see that in the book of Acts verses 10, uh, I mean, chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, when God showed, uh, God showed Peter a vision when he was hungry of, uh, of everything that he, that he could eat. And Peter himself was like, God, I cannot touch those things because they are unclean. But God said, don't, don't you call unclean what I call clean. When Christ died, he, he fulfilled the law and got rid of those old customs. So now pigs are not unholy animals. They are not unclean animals to, to, to us this day. But getting back to our story, that's just a little tidbit for you. He wasn't allowed to be around pigs. However, this was the only job he can get, a job that was beneath him. So what did that mean? He was not only in the climate of the flesh, but he was paying the cost of the flesh. He was paying the cost that was never intended for him. He was living beneath his purpose, his position, and the person that he was brought up to be. He had not only taken on the characteristics of the flesh, the climate of the flesh, and now paying the cost of the flesh, but now he was he was living beneath himself. He was living living beneath what his father had intended for his son. He found himself living under. He was he was entangled with things that he wasn't supposed to be entangled with. He was around people he wasn't supposed to be. Uh, uh, supposed to be around or supposed to uh, concern himself with. He was doing things that he knew wasn't right. In many translations, you this this story is headed by the title of the prodigal son. In many versions, it's also that he's the lost son. And as as we wrap up, what is the definition of a prod a prodigal? It's a person who leaves home and behaves recklessly, but later makes a, a, makes a return. Makes a repentant return, excuse me. Now, maybe you're not a prodigal child in the way that you left home or that you even left, left the church physically. But maybe you become prodigal in your heart. Maybe you become prodigal in your mind or even your spirit. Maybe you, you become prodigal in your approach to your career or the approach to success. Or maybe you become prodigal in your approach to relationships and even marriage. Maybe you become prodigal in your ways of thinking. Maybe you become prodigal in your finances and how you govern them and what you invest in and what you spend it on. Maybe you become prodigal in how you raise your children. You become less lenient. You allow them to do things that you know are questionable, but you're just saying, I'm letting them find their own way. Maybe you, be, maybe you become proud of Maybe you have left what you knew to be home. You knew to be true. You knew to be 
sustaining. You need to be the promises of God. Maybe you have left God's way and have begun to live recklessly. But I love the second part of that definition of prodigal. It's a person who leaves home and behaves recklessly, but later makes a makes a repentant a repentant a repentant return home. Excuse me. This means that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been involved with, you can turn away from it and come home. No matter what you've done, you can come home. Just like this, 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 just like this, this young man's father, God is not only willing to receive us back, but he's eagerly awaiting our return. He's looking for us daily and he will meet us even though we're still a little far off. Luke 15 and 20 says, so when he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. So let me tell you this. God is waiting for you with, with no judgment, but with forgiveness and acceptance. What does that tell us? That no matter where, we're, where we are in our lives, no matter where you're at, in the world, you don't have to be defined by your decisions. You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to keep living the way you're living, thinking the way you're thinking, even being with who, you, who you're who with. Living under a different identity, you don't, you, we're not defined by our bad decisions. God is willing to Accept us with no judgment, with, with clear love. Like, just, just like I said in, 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 uh, in Luke 15 and 17, it says, when he came to his sentence or when he came to himself, it says, how many of my father's hired servants have food enough to spare? And here I am uh, starving to death. Many people say this is a epiphany moment or a aha moment. It's the moment that you realize that there's more to, to life than the way you've been living. And for some of us, we're waiting on that moment to come. The moment to have that, that epiphany moment, that aha moment to wake us up and put us back on course. But let, let me tell you today. You don't have to continue to wait on that moment. Today can be your moment. Today can be the day that you receive Christ for yourself. Today can be the day that life changes for the better. Today can be the day you return home and you can return to living in the spirit. Today can be the day you realize that you've been living beneath what God has made you to be. Today can be your day. Like Just like this, the songwriter says, Songwriter uh, Will McDowell says in his song, I won't go back. It says, right now is the moment. Today is the day. I've been changed. I've been changed. So I, and I've waited for this moment to come for so long that I won't go back. I cannot go back to the way that I used to be. I cannot go back to the way before he changed my life. Before he changed, before his presence came and changed me. Uh, it's, right now can be the moment. Today is the day you can be changed. You can be changed. You, I know you've been waiting for that aha moment, for that epiphany moment. But today can be the can be the day that you make the right decision. The sun set his mind. To go home, he, he set on his mind, he positioned his body to return home. He says, I, I will go home as one of my father's servants. He, he, he thought so little of himself that even in his humility of himself, he says, I'm going to go back as a servant. But what I like is that his father met him where he was, rejoiced. 
brought him back home and says, my son has returned, not my servant. He didn't even get a chance to uh, offer servanthood to his father before his father brought him back into sonship. He greeted him and restored him to the status that he left. So what am I telling you today? You don't have to look down on yourself for whatever you did or from, or from wherever, wherever you have been. You don't have to look down on yourself. God still sees you as a son. God still sees you as a daughter. So what if you were the reason that they left or that it, that it all fell apart? So what if you lost it all? So what if they won't accept you? What if it's been a while? It's been a few years. So what if you did it and they were right about it? So, so what? So what if you've been living a different lifestyle? So what if you changed your gender and have been living under a different identity? So what? You can, that, I want to understand, you can. We all can be forgiven and restored. God will, will restore us back to the place that he called that he called us to be he positioned us to be before the foundation of the world god loves us and he will he, god loves you he will restore you and give you what you lost and give you back what you never thought you were worthy enough to receive when jesus died he not only took over the, the penalty of our sins but he also he also got rid of the guilt and the shame attached to our sins the book of Romans 8 and 1, it says like this, as I wrap up here, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who get this, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When you walk in the spirit through the precious uh, sacrifice of Christ Jesus, there's now no condemnation attached to you. You don't have to carry around the guilt or the shame you are forgiven and loved you can take on your rightful identity father god in the name of jesus we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy thank you for your patience lord for even even allowing us to go away in the first place knowing that one day we'll be would be back and you you are, you're just like the Father. You are looking for us eagerly every day to return to you. To return to the way that you, we, we know we should live. How we should think. To be around people that we know we should, we should be around. To live life the way that you have commanded it. To live the life that you... Uh, because we know that our thoughts are not your thoughts and our ways are not your ways. Your ways are higher above us, Father God. And that, and that you have plans for us that you give us hope and a future and a great end, Father. Father God, help us to trust you in our decision making. Help us to honor you in, our, in, in the way that we live. Help us to love you and those you love. Help us to accept your forgiveness. And help us to forgive ourselves, Lord. For sometimes that can be the biggest obstacle. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you have stayed on to hear what thus says the Lord. That today can be your day. Today can be your epiphany, your aha moment. That I've been living the way God never intended on me to live. There's more to life than the way I've been living. Today is your day. If, if anybody has been watching this and you don't, and, you, and, and you've never accepted Christ, today can be your day. Yeah. Today can be the day you accept God's love. No matter what you've done, no matter what sins you have committed, no matter what you have done, or even you will do in the rest of your life and your days of living, God's love will never change. And if you believe God and you believe in his son, Jesus Christ, 
and you confess it with your mouth and you believe it in your heart, you, son, you, daughter, are saved. You don't need to write a letter. You don't need to uh, jump over hoops. Just simple decision. Now, I do tell you, get into a good Bible-based church where you can live or with God, you can grow with God, and you can live a life that God has, has intended on, on for you to live. A better life. I, I won't say that there, there will never be problems or hard days. I won't say that, that you won't experience losses, that you won't experience setbacks, but they will not keep you. And God's love will always sustain you. I love each and every one of you, you today. And I, I tell you, come back next week where Minister Daniel Gant will be bringing a word of faith as well. I love you and have a good week.